I just got to tell you that, um, <clears throat> you know, the Bible tells us everything that can be shaken will be shaken. How many can feel the shaking? Now, God, I believe, has got a plan. He's letting the institutions of the world, which have all trusted in mammon. Mammon is a spirit that is how to get all your needs met apart from God in your own strength and according to what somebody else can supply. And there's always fear attached to it because you, can, you can't trust it. But, but once again, you know, Jesus said you can only serve God or mammon. And, um, and so God is shaking mammon. Yeah. So what does it look like when God shakes mammon? Well, things fall apart. People start losing money. All these things start breaking down. And, uh, and guess what happens? People start getting fearful and freaking out and, and uh, hoarding, all of these kinds of things. And, um, but what if you, as a believer are not trusting in mammon as you're trusting in the Lord. You, Jesus said, you know, store up treasure in heaven where your, where your treasure is. That's where your heart's going to be. And so I believe God is literally allowing things, the money of the world, to crash. So here's a question. If, if the U.S. dollar even crashes... Now you notice on your on your dollar bill it doesn't say in our money we trust. In God we trust. So that little piece of printed whatever it is, that's not your savior. You may be using it to buy and sell, but in God we trust. So so what if that piece of paper suddenly is worth only fifty percent of what it was yesterday? Who's in charge? Who, who's, who's taking care of your welfare? So I love, I love the story. This is not the message, this, by the way. I just, just felt like the Lord wanted me to bring this because some of you are, are getting, you're shaking with the shaking. And it's causing you to... Um, hunker down in fear and try to figure out how you're going to survive. More toilet paper will not bless your future. <laughs> but if you're familiar with the, uh, in the book of Exodus, the people of Israel, while God was reigning, God was shaking Israel, uh, excuse me, Egypt. He was challenging every single God that Egypt had trusted in and making them to look like nothing. And all of Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's power was tied in those gods because he was considered to be one of the gods, part of the God system. So God's just going along and blowing out every one of Pharaoh's support systems as he's saying, let my people go. So here's the Egyptians just just being obliterated by all of the stuff that they had trusted. But here's the Israelites. Where are they living? They're living in this place called the land of Goshen. And in that place, there were no plagues. There was no visitation of, of all that. And, and so you could leave the land of Goshen, and here you are in utter darkness. All you had to do was walk over to the land of Goshen, and there's the light. You're over here in, in the rest of Egypt, and you got frogs and gnats <laughs> and bloody water. Well, you, know, you come over here to the land of Goshen, none of it exists. God had literally drawn a barrier line between the two. You could probably stand in Goshen and see a whole wall of gnats. And <laughs> Stay there. The scripture tells us in the, the book of Genesis that Isaac, when he heard that there was a famine in the land it was, and it was going to increase and get worse, that's because he read the farmer's almanac. <laughs> 
the great, that great prophetic book, you know. And so he said, I got to get out of here. I got to go, I got to get, go down to Egypt so that I can be safe. And God speaks to him. He says, don't you leave your land of promise. Don't you leave my plan for you. Don't believe that what's happening in the environment around you is going to be able to take you out of my promise and my blessing. He said, I want you to stay in the land and I want you to sow. I want you to put your seed in the ground, though there is no rain. And Isaac's natural mind probably said that would be insanity because once I put my seed in the ground, that's it. Because if, if you don't get a crop from that, you don't have seed for the next year, do you? But God said, sow, sow this year in the famine and I'll take care of you. And Isaac, so Isaac didn't run to Egypt. He stayed there. He believed God. He put his seed into dry, dusty soil. And the Bible tells us that next year he reaped 100 fold return. It was green around Isaac, full of plants, full harvest. And it said it caused him to become wealthier than everybody else around him. And therefore, the king of that area became afraid of him because he could see that God's hand was on him. And the king finally said, you need to get out of here. There's a story in that. Let your imagination go with the Holy Spirit and let faith arise inside of you. Okay, I want you to turn to um, – where am I going to have you go to? Oh, Proverbs 14. We're going to start there. Verses 26 and 27. I want you to hear these words. The fear of the Lord – is oppressive and will drain the life out of you. The fear of the Lord will just make you a religious sourpuss. Put you in great bondage. And you'll never know how much God loves you. Is that what it says? I'm just testing you. Because that's what's actually being taught out there in many places. Don't you talk about the fear of the Lord. You know, you're, that's just, no, we're just in awe. We're just in reverence. We're in this wonderful love relationship with God, so you're never afraid. This says the, the fear of the Lord. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Wow. And his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. When God calls us to walk in, in the fear of him, it's so that he can get something to us that's going to be life-giving to us and protect us from the things that are out there that we actually have no ability to protect ourselves from. We're not that smart. We're not that powerful. But God is. And so the fear of the Lord keeps you centered in him so that you are able to stand in a position where of an understanding that as you have made him to be your God. And as I was talking last week about he, he has now become the center of your universe. Everything in your life is orbiting around him 24-7. You, you don't see anybody else. You don't consider anybody else. He, he's your first consideration. And the reality of him and his power and his love and his goodness and his righteousness and justice, it, it has permeated every part of your, your consciousness and your subconscious living. And so you live in constant relationship with his presence and his greatness and his rightness and his authority. And as we do that, we come into this beautiful relationship with him where he actually then becomes our confidence. The heart of the orphan is to develop their own self-confidence in order to protect themselves, in order to become something great in the eyes of the world and in their own eyes. But when you're walking in the fear of the Lord, you know who you are because he told you. 
There is no second opinion about you. There, there is no alternative value of, about your life. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about you or the way that they treat you. You are who God says you are, and you are as valuable as he says you are, and you can stand in that. So you don't need to, to have a confidence in yourself because somehow you got your act together. You, now you're smart enough. Now you're talented enough. Now, now you, you got enough money. Now you got whatever you think it takes to give you confidence. The fear of the Lord as you stand close to him and he, he, he is now the one you're orbiting around. He becomes my confidence. That means I don't have to, to take in consideration what is happening around me because my God is determining all of those things. Yes, there is a devil. And yes, he's going to take his best shots at me. But I'm tucked into my God. I know nothing but him. I have no other consideration. His word is the number one thing in my life. His ways, his thoughts, his judgments, I'm tucked in there. And so it doesn't matter what the enemy's trying to do. Because even if he tries to wound me and, and knock me down, in my God, I get back up. In my God, I recover. And when I recover, I get a sevenfold return back from the enemy. Man, you missed your opportunity to shout right there. There is strong confidence in the fear of the Lord. Wow. And his children will have a refuge. Can I tell you that, that there are many families that are very shaky? The kids themselves don't have a sense of a strong refuge in their own home because God is not fiercely at the center of that home. He's talked about, maybe there's a few prayers that are thrown toward him at dinner time or whatever, but God himself, the fear of God is not in the center of that home so that the kids can see very clearly who's in charge. Who are we trusting in? Who is our first consideration? But when the parents make God the biggest thing in that house, the kids will have a refuge. It works. I don't need for my kids to think that I'm so strong and so mighty and I got my act together. I need my kids to see me standing under a big God and I trust in him and he takes care of me. Because I fear him. I love him and I fear him. That'll give your kids a, a security that they don't have. Okay, I'm going to just leave that one right there. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. What does a fountain do? It just keeps on supplying. It just keeps on pushing up and pouring out. There's no end to it. Life itself, the life that I'm seeking, is connected to the fear of the Lord. I, that means I have an access to a level of life in God that I would not have otherwise. I have a continuous supply of something that God is able to pour into me that looks like life. And not death. Because I have so centered myself in him. Many of these things are intangible. Not necessarily measurable. Like if I just do this, then this happens. It's a place that you live and you stay in. And the benefits of, of life just are pouring into you. And, you, and you, you just know over a period of time, hey, I am more alive now than I was before. The things that could have, would have taken me out before, they didn't take me out. In God I trust. That's good, isn't it? One may avoid the snares of death. How many of you know there are snares of death out there waiting? Cool. Yeah. But I don't have to live fearful of those snares.
The world's terrified of those snares. I don't have to live afraid of the snares. Yeah, they're there. But God is my confidence. He takes care of those things. He knows, he knows exactly how to tell me where to step and not to step. If I'm listening. Okay, I want you to go to Psalm 111. I heard this verse in my teenage years. As I was uh, emerging into my adulthood and trying to figure out how I was going to be a success in life and all the rest. And I heard this verse. It caught my attention. And I said, I need to know about this. Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As soon as, soon as I heard that phrase, I said, I need wisdom. Where do I start? I'm going to, well, I'm going to go read Confucius and get confused. <laughs> or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to find, you know, some book of wisdom. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to find some guru or whatever. No. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And here, here's the deal about it is, is that your ability to sort out what is true and not true, what is God's perspective on all things, what works and what doesn't work, what's, what's, what's right and what's wrong, all those things. You can read all about that stuff. You can hear all kinds of things, but you won't be able to sort it out to have a strong sense of this is dead center exactly where I need to be until you're in the fear of the Lord. It's something about being in the fear of the Lord that causes you when you get around the wisdom of God to immediately know it and recognize it. It, it just allows you to, it, it actually causes wisdom to be attracted to you like a magnet. Wisdom will find you and you'll find it because there is no wisdom apart from the fear of the Lord. Now, a lot of people out there trying to offer all kinds of wisdom. Even Christians are offering wisdom, but they, they have no fear of the Lord. And so what they're, what they're teaching is skewed with all kinds of other stuff in there. And it'll actually mess you up. And the only reason I know that is because I've been around a long time now. I've been around decades watching where various kinds of teachings in the church have taken people. And I've seen the fruit of it. It sounded good on the surface, but there was no fear of the Lord in it. And so even though it seemed to offer life, it actually became uh, a distraction at the very best and just destruction at the very worst. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. Now, this, this is a, a double statement that is often used in the Hebrew. You'll find it especially in the Psalms where the same thing is repeated twice, but with different words. And so what the psalmist is saying here, we don't know who wrote this psalm, but he's saying a good understanding of all those who do his commandments. So he's saying that is the same as the fear of the Lord. So if, you're, if you fear the Lord, therefore you're doing his commandments. And if you are doing his commandments, guess what you're going to end up with? A good understanding. Yeah. That's in short supply these days. I need a good understanding. I need the wisdom of God so I can move forward. And it says his praise endures forever. There is a praise that comes to God because you and I actually walk in his wisdom and with a good understanding. We become the living proof that God is right all the time. And he should be obeyed and followed and feared. He is the center. See, when you understand that Satan is at, has been at war with this from the beginning. He has tried to pull us away from God, that God is not the center. He's tried to convince us God's not good. You can't trust him. He's, he's, uh, he's going to mess you up somehow. You need to become your own God. You need to create your own universe with you at the center. That's exactly, that's really the essence of sin. It's, it, sin is everything that you do, even if it looks good. It's everything that you do with you at the center of your universe. 
versus everything that you do because God is your center. Okay, Psalm 25. Let's go there. If you didn't have breakfast this morning, this will fill you up. I want to start with verse 12. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Oh, that's a good question. That means as you look across the landscape of people, you can find somebody. They walk in the fear of the Lord. That person there? Nah. But there are those who do and those who don't. And you can choose to be one who does. And so he says, so who is the man who fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way that he should choose. If I want to have access to the will of God and to the knowledge of God, and the best choices for my life, because there's only one person who actually knows who I am and where I'm going and what I was born for, the destiny and purpose of my life. And so the smartest thing I could do is be connected to the voice of God, the instruction of God, saying, this is what you should choose. How many choices are you going to make today? Countless. God gave us the power of the will he didn't make us robots. He made us sons and daughters created in his image, but he left free will with us to choose. And so we choose every single day, and God doesn't interfere with any of that. He doesn't make you and I do anything. That's scary. But it's also powerful because you have now been given the ability to operate in the image of God himself, and you choose. And so you want to make every choice count. To, your choices are going to either produce more of God or something else. So here, who is the man who fears the Lord? Well, God will come alongside of you, and he'll show you. He'll instruct you on what to choose. Mm. Boy, I need that. I really need that. And we're going to be making some big choices in the days ahead. Big choices. You're going to find yourself sitting right at the crossroads of a major choice, and you're going to be you're going to find yourself afraid because you're going to say, "Whoa, what if I make the wrong choice here?" But if you've been walking in the fear of the Lord, and you know that He's with you, and you've been developing His Word inside of you and and His ways, and 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 you're just ready to obey His voice at any time, you can be in the middle of that crossroads, and the voice of the Lord will be right there and say, "Choose this." And you don't even have to understand why that choice is, is so good. You just know that you've heard the Lord say, choose this. And when you choose it, you'll actually feel the peace of God come on it. You'll, you'll just have that sense of, ooh, that, that felt like wisdom. I felt, I felt some power on that. I, I felt light going forward. Your word is a light unto my path. Yeah, I like it. He will instruct him in the way that he should choose, and his soul will abide in prosperity. You and I were not only called to operate in physical prosperity, but prosperity of soul. Your mind, your will, and your emotions are in good shape. You're functioning well. You not you are not a dysfunctional person walking around not knowing exactly what you're doing, where you go. You know what? When you're dysfunctional, everybody around you gets slimed somehow. I mean, they they, they might still love you and you know whatever. They just they just can't be around you very much because your dysfunction is kind of sucking the life out of them. I hate to say that. It's just, it's just true. And I've seen it in me. I've seen it when, I, when I've been dysfunctional and how I've affected other people. Ooh, uh. 
I don't want that. I want, I want to have a prosperous soul. That the, that the thoughts going through my head are God's thoughts. That my, and then my emotions, which usually follow your thoughts, are under control and they're being directed in where I'm not agreeing with the negativity of the devil. But I'm, I'm just, I know who I am and I've got the peace of God. I've got the joy of the Lord. The peace, the joy. Oh, man. I'm rich. You and I were called to walk in a lifestyle that every day as we're living, we feel a sense of richness in being alive. I'm not dreading the day because I'm not sure how I'm going to handle it. I'm afraid I'm going to fall apart. I'm, I, I'm waiting for something to, to hit me that's going to blow my blow me out of my saddle. You know? But instead, I, I can get up and say, you know what? I'm walking with God today. I have everything that I need in him. And he is doing a wonderful work in my life. The Holy Spirit is with me. The word of the Lord is with me. And I'm growing and I'm getting stronger and I'm becoming more like him. And I'm not a problem. I'm a promise. And you, get, you just get to walk through life and you just feel this prosperity of, and richness. And you say, you know what? I'm a blessing waiting to happen. I'm an answer. I'm carrying something. I'm rich. I'm prosperous. Even my emotions are coming into line and, and, and juicing up my brain to have even more positive and wonderful thoughts, to create more powerful words. Okay. Could do a whole message on just on that. And here's, he says, and his descendants will inherit the land. We were made to take over. Not by force, but by inheritance. Things, things, you know, inheritance comes to you. You don't buy it. Things are just handed to you by somebody else's choice. So, if you're inheriting the land, it means it belonged to, it belonged to somebody else, but now it's come to you. Oh, that would never happen to me. That, that kind of stuff happens to other people, but that would never happen to me. <laughs> and inheriting the land isn't just about inheriting property and and possessions, it's it's about coming in, into to ownership and and rulership and management of more and more things that are going on out there. It just it just keeps coming towards you. You actually attract it. People actually want to give stuff to you. You inherit the land and your descendants. So you're setting your you're setting up your descendants to inherit what once belonged to somebody else. The whole Old Testament, you just read the Old Testament and God, God just, he, he picked his people. He set them up. He said, now this, I'm giving this to you. You're going to inherit all of this. We're now co-heirs with Christ. What's that about? That's about inheriting. It's about the things that now belong, that have belonged to Jesus now belong to me. And I've got to step into it and learn how to take possession and to manage it. Woo. Did you know this stuff's in the book? Oh, my God. Now, listen to this, verse 14. The secret of the Lord. Some of you, your translations say the counsel of the Lord. The secret of the Lord or the secret counsel of the Lord, actually, in some translations. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. 
This might help you inherit the land. This might help you become prosperous. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. That's like insider trading. I mean, the guy who's in charge of everything, he knows everything. He knows what's going to happen next. He knows where every, everything is already. He knows every hidden thing that other people don't know. And he's, so he's got secrets. He's got counsel. He's got stuff that he would like to share with us for our benefit, for our upgrade. And, and when that comes to you and you begin to operate it, it's, people look at you and say, man, you are favored. How would you get that blessing in your life? Well, I know secrets. I got, I got the secret counsel of the Lord. You know, and how that counsel comes to you is not necessarily definable. It just happens. You, you are in proximity. The fear of the Lord puts you in proximity to the, the voice of God, the heart of God. Because, you know, here, here's the thing about the fear of the Lord. It's not that you, it, it's not this terror of God, although sometimes we should be. But there's a trust in God at such a level that you are leaning into his heart because that's the only heart that's going somewhere that always comes out right. So the fear of the Lord just causes me to push in as, as tightly as I can because I, I see what's there. And I don't want anything else. And I know to move away from that heart is like stupid. And, and I see what's happening to all the other people out there who don't give a rip about what God says and think that they're in charge of their own lives and they can defy God and do whatever they want to do. I'm watching what's happening to them. Their life stinks. I'm serious. I really mean that. I don't care how much money they have. Their life stinks. They don't have peace. They don't know what I know. They might be smart, but they're also deaf, dumb, and blind. They're, they're blind guides leading the blind, falling into the same pit. I'm watching what's happening. Our global elites are going to save the planet. Oh, God help us. They're so smart, they figured out that you can just be any gender that you want to be. Idiots! I say that lovingly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, th there are scriptures where God, God has himself, he has said they have become altogether stupid. That's not a judgment. It's a fact <laughs> from God's perspective. You know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, I, the church ne needs to get an upgrade on, on, on looking at fools. What does a fool look like? And so they can choose not to be one. Because fools make foolish choices. And they always lead to destruction. Always, 100%. But the secret counsel of the Lord is with those who fear him. I'm a, I have an access to the mind and the heart, the wisdom of God. And he wants to show me things. It's not just about getting prophetic downloads from the Holy Spirit. It's a combination of all of it together. And you can have a prophetic gift operating in your life, but not have the fear of the Lord. And something's going to go wrong. Balaam is an example out of the Old Testament. He could hear God. But boy, did he make some stupid choices. 
And the book of Jude tells us that in the church today, there will be the spirit of Balaam operating, trying to lead by a prophetic voice, but there is no fear of God with them. And Jude says, if you hang out with them, you're heading for shipwreck. Stay away from them. See, if I, when I see, I can see somebody operating with all kinds of spiritual gifts and anointing and so forth, but I don't see any fear of the Lord in them. I just step back. I was watching a major ministry that was exploding. And uh, everybody was rallying to this and saying, this is going to be the next big revival that's going to happen. And all this stuff. And all I knew is I kept I kept looking at this guy that everybody was putting up on a pedestal and and uh, and he was operating in just phenomenal gifts, all, you know, words of knowledge and people being healed and great miracles were happening. And and, uh, and even a lot of people coming to the Lord and all the rest. And I, I just kept watching and watching. And in my gut, I said, there's no fear of God in that man's life. And I told Margie, I said, I, I, I don't, I see all these spiritual leaders. They're all running to this guy. They're people that I respect and they're all getting behind him and all the rest. And I said, I don't understand what's going on, but my gut is telling me that's a train wreck ready to happen. And within one month, <clears throat> he took a lot of people with him, lost his marriage and destroyed oh, so many people's lives destroyed. There's a difference between having a prophetic word versus the secret counsel of the Lord. I don't want to just have information from God. I want true knowledge. Swinging a double-edged sword through the room here today. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. He will make them know his covenant. You can know theologically about the covenant of the Lord. You can study the scriptures and understand the Old Testament covenant, the New Testament covenant through the blood of Jesus. And, but there is a relationship, a covenantal relationship with God where you are walking with him heart to heart, completely committed, where you, you have come into sacrificial connection with him. You've drawn blood. You, you know, so many covenants were blood covenants. Even when and God made that uh, covenant with Abraham, he had him cut all those animals in half and, and, uh, and God walked through the middle of it. I mean, it was whew, the covenant of the Lord. David had a covenant with, with God. And it wasn't just about him getting anointed as king and, and all these other things that happened with him. David had something going on. He had a covenant going on with God. And that covenant was referred to in Isaiah 49, many, many years later. And God spoke to the Israelites and he said, I will cause you to have a covenant with me like I had with David. And that covenant still exists in heaven right now. That covenant is part of what caused David to have a throne in heaven that Jesus is now sitting on. Did you know Jesus is sitting on the throne of his father, David? And it began with a covenant. See, David, so David walked, he, he wasn't just the great worshiper. He, he literally walked in covenant relationship with God. He knew who he was with God and who God was with him, and nothing was going to break that connection. And God is saying, those who fear me, are going to be brought into a knowledge of covenant with me. I'm going to begin to disclose myself with you, and you're, you're going to share yourself with me, and we're going to end up in this unbreakable bond between us. And I would say to you, there are very few who have known the name of Jesus who have ever gotten to that place. And part of it is because they had no fear of God. 
But here's the promise. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. Can I tell you that God is looking for this covenantal relationship with us? Yes, it has been set through the blood of Jesus now by faith and by grace. We've been brought into a covenant relationship with him. But you can have the covenant and not know the covenant. You can have the covenant but not actually walk in the experience of it. Because it's a relational thing. It's not just a judicial legal thing. I hope I'm making you hungry right now. This is part of what I'm pressing in for. God keeps showing me, Paul, this covenant is way deeper than you've ever known. I'm calling you farther. I'm inviting you in. God is actually, he's inviting every single one of us into this relationship with him. He wants to share his secrets. This is Paul's great cry in Philippians 3. He said, oh, that I may know him. the power of his resurrection and even the fellowship of his sufferings. See, even sharing the fellowship of his sufferings is a covenantal thing. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm walking with my God. And even, even what Jesus knew in his sufferings with the Father, I, I want to know that. Not that I have to enter into every suffering that Jesus went through at the level that he went through it, but it's about the heart. It's about the mind. It's about what you're choosing. It's about what you're loving. How many of you know it, it takes a great love to choose the fellowship of sufferings? The fear of the Lord. He will make them to know his covenant. So David says, my eyes are continually toward the Lord. For he will pluck my feet out of the net. Part of what the fear of the Lord looks like is it controls where your eyes go every time. My eyes are continually upon the Lord. That means my even on the subconscious level, no matter what I'm going through, my first my first reaction is right to him. My first thought in in everything is my God and His kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. That's my first place that I go to. We have to learn that fear of the Lord. We, we learn and we train our hearts toward. We were looking at that last, last week where David said, give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. And so we're in this walk with God and the Holy Spirit is empowering us and helping us so that, so that our heart, every piece of our heart is being pulled together so that the very first thing that I consider, no matter what I'm going through, it's him. My, my first love, my, my first desire, everything. My first consideration of even the consequences that could come into my life if I, if I violate his will. My, my mind's just right there, first thing. Doesn't matter what the temptation is that I'm going through. It's the fear of the Lord just immediately brings me right back to but what does my God say? What's at stake here? What does this relationship require of me? How will this shape my future, my eternity? You need to understand, and we don't have time to get into it today, but we are shaping our eternity right now. There are decisions. A lot of people think, hey, I'm just, I'm just greasy gracing it into heaven. And when I get there, everything's going to be good. But we are literally shaping our heavenly experience right now. I don't have time to get into all those verses, but there's a bunch of them. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. And do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. 
do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. That's next week. But see, this is not a heavy thing. You fi you figure this out, and you you realize where how to get to home plate quick and score some home runs. That's where you want to be. So when you realize that Satan has been working your entire life to deceive you and to get you to accept an alternative and come up with another way to run your life apart from God and remember that the good is the enemy of the best. I, I, say, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to end up with just good. I want the best. And the power of getting the best is in my hands right now. And the Holy Spirit is with me to make it happen. And the devil cannot stop you if you choose it. So everything I've been telling you today is, is all related to the fear of the Lord. And what's happening in the room right now is the, fear of the spirit of the fear of the Lord is actually coming on you to instruct you. To capture your heart. I'm not trying to psychologically manipulate you. I'm just releasing that spirit into the room. And um, choice is still yours. Say la. <laughs> okay, we got to end. Do you know that was in the, this book? Wow. Let's have a, everybody that wants a secret counsel of the Lord just stand right now. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. We gotta go. Oh Lord, there's a place that we may stand with you. It's a little bit closer than we thought might be more costly than we <laughs> were prepared for. But Lord, you have set before us life and death. You set before us the good and the better. And I just believe, Holy Spirit, you have been releasing something over us here today, calling us. It's an upward call. And Lord, some of us need, just need to agree right now that you have already qualified us to live this way, and we can do this. We're not outside of it. And I, I, just, I just break off every lie that would try to come on somebody right now and say, oh, you can't do that. That's too hard, or you're too messed up, or whatever. That's, a, that's lies. The fear of the Lord is for everybody. When you were born again, you were born into the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You received, that's Holy Spirit you received is the spirit of the fear of the Lord, sevenfold spirit of God. So the ability and the calling is on us right now to walk in these things. And Lord, we just, as we stand before you, we, we choose the fear of the Lord. Even if we don't fully understand it. And we choose to push away that fear that somehow we're going to get hurt because we're talking about fear. But Lord, right now you're inviting us to come. Come and know my covenant. Come and know my secret. Draw close to me. Choose to let the, the spirit of the fear of the Lord work in your life. And I will bring you prosperity of soul. I will bring you the inheritance of the land. I will bring you a confidence that you've never known. I will, I will bring a refuge to your children. So, Lord, I, I, all we can do is just say, 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you that you are here. We choose to let that spirit come and rest on us right now. I will walk in the fear of the Lord. So when somebody raises that question, who is that man that fears the Lord? We're going to immediately raise our hands and say, that's me. You're talking about me right here. <laughs> Woo. And Lord, as I choose to walk in the fear of the Lord, people are going to be running to me. People are going to be bringing things to me. The favor is going to be all over me. Increase blessing. Strength. Thank you, Lord. So I just bless all of us here today, Lord, with more of this. May we experience it this even this week in a very tangible way. In the mighty name of Jesus, we believe that we receive it. Amen, amen.